You're listening to The Joyous Podcast with Mike Carden, where we talk to the world's most interesting business thinkers about life and work, and work and life. For show notes and other content referenced in this podcast, visit joyoushq.com slash podcast. And now, here's Mike. Hello, and welcome to The Joyous Podcast. I'm Mike Carden, co-founder of Joyous. My guest today is Gary Hamill. In fact, let me do that again. My guest today is none other than the Gary Hamill. Gary is one of the world's most influential and iconoclastic business thinkers. Uh, He's been on the faculty of the London Business School for more than 30 years and is director of the management lab. I'm sure I'm not alone and that throughout my business life, I've been forwarded many articles in the Harvard Business Review, and then most of them turn out to be written by Gary. And that is because Gary has written 17 articles for the HBR. He's also written several books, of course, including Humanocracy, which is one of my favorites with one of my favorite ever taglines, which is uh, creating organizations as amazing as the people inside them. So, Gary, welcome to the show. Mike, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Hey, now I like to start these podcasts and and regular listeners will know this with with the origin story, as they say, in, in superhero movies. So, so tell us, take us right back. Where does the Gary Hamill story begin? Well, I suppose it begins uh, in southwestern Michigan with uh, a couple of parents who are academics and uh, kind of set me on that on on that course. Uh, uh, and uh, then doing a PhD at the University of Michigan, I was doing that uh, in the late 1970s. That's a long time ago, uh, but that was really the first point at which. Uh, U.S. industry was really challenged by international competition, particularly the Japanese in the car industry uh, based uh, in, in, in Detroit. And I remember at the time, you know, watching the U.S. lose its leadership and, and seeing the impact that had for families and communities, the neighbors without jobs, uh, Detroit being hollowed out, and, and really understanding that everything I had studied that I was doing around management and organization and so on was not, was not just theory. This had, in profound impacts on people's lives. And when leaders got it wrong, you know, they weren't really the people who paid the price. It was everybody else who paid the price. And so I think that as much as anything kind of set me on this course of understanding how critical it is to build organizations that can see over the horizon, have the courage to change before they need to, uh, that that respect the views of everybody in those organizations. So yeah, that that was a pretty signal moment for me. And um uh, set me up for, you know, many years of, I think, interesting research on really what drives the performance of, of large organizations. Yeah, that's certainly fascinating. I, I love that piece of, of you know, actually seeing the impact of business strategy rather than, you know, thinking about it as, as a theory. Um, look, we, we were both on the, the Joyous Advisory Board call recently, and something that really struck me that you said was that it was impossible to, to set strategy from the top down. Um, do, do you want to just expand on that? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's this kind of strange anomaly or, you know, paradox in that, you know, we expect people at the top of the pyramid to set strategy, to have the vision. And yet when you think about it, and, and you ask the question, where in the organization are you likely to find the people who have most of their emotional equity invested in the past? Where do you find the people who are most inclined to, 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 to want to def- defend decisions that were made a decade or two ago? Where are the people who are probably most insulated from you know what's going on with customers and technology and so on, it's at the top, and then and then we expect these people to somehow have have the foresight, the wisdom, the creativity to kind of set direction. I, it's just like it doesn't work, and and in fact, you know what you find typically is when organizations miss the future, it's almost always because there was a failure of vision at the top, uh, and uh, you know they they are particularly prone to denial. So you just see this again and again and again. And if you think about creating strategy as, as a, a process that's essentially about innovation. So, you know, living for many, many years in Silicon Valley, what I understand is, you know, you have to create, you know, a thousand startups to find a couple of unicorns to find, you know, the next Google or Facebook or whatever it may be. And I think it's the same when you think about strategy in large organizations. To find a truly game-changing strategy, you have to generate a lot of strategic options, you know, at the outset. And then you can sift through them and what, what may make a difference or not. And so what you find in many organizations is that the strategy process is very linear. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really, it's, it's not expansive. 
they don't generate a lot of strategic options at the outset. So you're 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 sifting through a very small number of kind of incremental uh, strategies, and 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 therefore you miss the future. So you know, I think it's partly a failure at the top, but no no group of leaders, however smart or clever, simply has this ability to build out a very rich, robust portfolio of strategic options and sift through them. For that, you have to, you know, reach out to the whole organization and beyond and ask them, you know, what, what could we do next? What do you see changing in the world? Where do you think our opportunities are? And so leaders need to be much more kind of strategy editors where, you know, you, you create all of that and they look across all those ideas. They find the patterns, the themes, the threads and say, gee, you know, maybe this is where we need to go. And I've done a lot of work through the years on these kind of open strategy initiatives. And I can tell you, you get much better results than you do out of, you know, classically what we call strategic planning, which is pretty much just a budgeting exercise in most companies. So, so what you're saying is that the people at the periphery really are seeing what's happening. Is that is that right? That that they the front line are, are closer to the to the competitors. They're closer to the disappointed customers. But the the C suite is is sort of insulated by layers of managers. Is, is that is that the well, same? Insulated by layers, not only layers of managers. But managers, Mike, who've learned that there is little profit in challenging the prejudices and assumptions of of their leaders, and so you know it, it's interesting if you, if you think about you know an organization, a typical global company today has seven or eight layers in it. So if you think about the time it takes for some kind of weak signal out on the periphery to kind of work its way up through all of those layers and all the, that, that that kind of politicized organization, by the time an issue gets big enough, and it could be a problem or an opportunity. By the time it gets big enough uh, to capture the attention of the CEO, you are by definition already on the back foot, which is why most, you know, most so-called transformation programs or change programs are actually catch-up programs. They're very seldom get-ahead programs. So you just have this super long uh, kind of lag between sense and respond in a hierarchical organization. And, you know, and, and you know, this is more than anything else. Why, why, you know, virtually always large incumbents are late to the future. I mean, virtually always. Mm. Yeah, is there any examples? Is there examples where that's not the case? That, that's one of the things I always wonder. I mean, I, I know what you say is true, but is there examples where that's not the case? Is there a way you actually can break this? Well, I, I think there are not many examples of large incumbents who are in front of the curve, but I am very hopeful that you can, you know, you can, you can change this. Um, as, as some of your uh, listeners might know, if they read my latest book, I've been very close to the Chinese company Hire over the last uh, decade or so, and have been an advisor and helped them. And you know, they they build an organization where everybody's an entrepreneur, where where you have enormous freedom to start new businesses. The organization supports that. It's easy to get experimental capital. It's easy to build a team. Uh, and so, you know, they've pioneered in a lot of areas very proactively that you wouldn't have expected at an appliance company. For example, uh, they re-engineered the entire uh, Chinese uh, blood supply, uh, starting with refrigeration of blood, but then way beyond that, using the Internet of Things to create a much more efficient distribution system for collecting uh, and using blood across China. Well, that's not what you'd expect a, a, a uh, appliance company to do. But, but when mm. you build an organization where entrepreneurship is everybody's job, uh, then, you know, the, so I'm like, I'm very optimistic. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Some years back, I, and this must be now 20 years back, I was having a conversation with Jim March, a famous professor at Stanford University, and, and literally just a giant of organizational theory. And we were sitting in my office in California, and I, I, and I said to him, I said, Jim, do you believe that kind of large bureaucrat, large, large organizations can ever be entrepreneurial at their core? And he says, no. He says, like, I've never seen it. I don't think it's possible. And I thought that was like really kind of discouraging, right? Like this simply is impossible. And what I realized, of course, is, you know, Jim and basically every other organizational theorist, they have spent their whole lives studying organizations that were bureaucratic at their core that had eight or nine levels and blah, blah, blah. And guess what? Those organizations cannot be very entrepreneurial. They're not going to, but that doesn't mean you can't build a large organization that is also entrepreneurial. This is for sure possible. give a bunch of examples in humanocracy. So I'm very optimistic, um, but a little bit um, uh, disappointed at how slow the progress has been in you know, helping large companies figure out how do you pioneer new businesses. I mean, one, one example, of course, is Amazon. Uh, probably uh, half of their market value now comes from uh, Amazon Web Services, 
And, you know, that seems like a very strange business to get in if you're, if you're an e-commerce company. But of course, if you've built, you know, one of the world's largest internet infrastructures and you have a lot of excess capacity, you start to sell that as a service to others. And so there are examples of, you know, there are not many, but there are examples of companies that have, uh, you know, overcome the inertia, pioneered new markets, but definitely the exception rather than the rule. Yeah, the Amazon examples, or well, the AWS example is a fascinating one, right? I wonder, I wonder where in the organization that starts. You know, is that some, is that something that you know, towards the periphery, someone sees the opportunity, that, or is it, you know, is it kind of? Now, it, it depends on who you ask at Amazon. I've I've got different <laughs> stories there, but I do think it started kind of in the middle of the organization, literally as as just you know, IT people saying we have a lot of excess capacity, like why can't we sell this? At the same time, Amazon was doing kind of an audit of its of its core competencies and thinking about which of these could be platforms for growth. So I think that kind of bottom up sense of, hey, there's an opportunity there and a top down kind of search for where else can we go? Those things intercepted and, 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 and off it went. But again, I think the primary problem in most large organizations is they, they, they just don't spend enough time looking over the horizon. Uh, they don't put enough energy into funding the future. You know, they, they, they over overfund what is at the expense of what could be. And, you know, you see this as an example for, you know, for, for Disney. So here's the world's largest entertainment company with all kinds of entertainment assets and films and amusement parks and television and so on. And yet they're more than a decade late to streaming. Like how, yeah. how the heck did that happen? Or, or you look at, you know, and, and this is now a very well-known example, but, you know, you look at EVs. Um, the things that made EVs possible, in fact, not only possible, but inevitable. So one of those is growing CO2 emissions. Like we all know that's a problem and we've been able to see that for 20 years. Number two, you have declining costs of uh, lithium batteries, uh, you know, dollars per kilowatt hours, been, been going down and down and down very rapidly. And then finally, you have this explosive growth in the capacity of GPUs. Uh, uh, and so you put those things together and you have the chance for EVs and autonomous vehicles. So none of those, those were trends that go back at least a couple of decades. And I was really, I was literally thinking the other day, Mike, so Tesla brings out the Model S in 2012, the first kind of viable mainstream uh, uh, EV, EV. And I was thinking like, okay, all the guys at that time, and unfortunately, they were all guys, all the guys at that time running the world's biggest auto companies, you know, Mercedes, Toyota, Ford, you know, what were they thinking about in 2012? They were all extremely well paid, right? But I can tell you, mm -hmm. they weren't. You know, I, I think somebody at GM at the time described Tesla as a, a bunch of an e engineers fooling around with laptop batteries. So these guys were all being paid eight, nine, ten. I think at Ford, Alan Mulally, twenty million dollars a year. But apparently, you got to pay executives even more if you want foresight, right? Because uh, <laughs> you know that must be like, you know, you got to add that as a something else in the contract. But yeah, I mean. Just not enough curiosity, not enough time looking over the horizon, spending too much time talking to people in the industry that think the same way they think. So yeah, it's a it's it's but but it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, I mean, of course you've you've stated it before, right? But it's a situation where you know the the coalition for the status quo you know, is 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 winning the battle effectively versus the coalition for change. And if you look at it now, even. Um, you know, the European car manufacturers are just so far behind the curve. You know, they're, 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 they're still working out ways to, to basically not become EV manufacturers more than they're working out ways to, to challenge, you know, the upstarts like yeah, Tesla. I, you know, there's, there's a strange thing, and you see this in the growth of any, 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 any company, but you get to a point where you start to feel you have more to lose uh, by challenging the status quo than, than not, right? And you, you kind and no alarm bells go go off, but you you suddenly shift from from being on offense to being on defense, and that's just you know when that happens, like that's you know thereafter it's all downhill, and I mm -hmm. think, you know, um, yeah, there was just an arrogance in the German automobile industry, particularly um, they completely underestimated how difficult it is to build the software for the, for these automobiles, and you know. And, and back to our conversation about strategy, you know, Tesla had a very clear strategy. We're, we're, we're going to accelerate the world's transition to, to renewable energy. So a very ambitious strategy, a stretch strategy that, that demands a lot of innovation to make that happen. And then some just very clear pillars about uh, software-defined vehicles, autonomous driving, vertical integration, and so on. 
And that kind of clarity and stretch, uh, you know, is going to beat uh, incrementalism and conservatism every single time. And, you know, Elon Musk, for all of his faults and his controversies, you know, he's absolutely right when he says the fundamental determinant in any industry of, 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 you know, winning and losing is the pace of innovation. And they've just outpaced everybody else for now, you know, more than a decade. Um, one of the things I like in that vision for Tesla, too, of wanting to you know, accelerate the world's shift to renewables is that that strategy clearly stretches beyond the boundaries of their own business as well. It's yeah, they, they took on board something which was actually bigger than themselves, and certainly a lot bigger than themselves back in you know, in 2012. Um, and I think that that's it's a combination of of not just being able to kind of sort of shift towards the future, um, but being kind of willing to do it right, being willing to do it at a at a at a real scale. You know, you could argue, and I've heard people argue, well, well, like Tesla had nothing to lose, and I, you know, I I think there's. There's this kind of false argument and, uh, you know, you, you hear people talk about disruptive innovation and cannibalization. And I've always thought that's not quite the right way to think about this. You know, it's disruptive only if you want to hang on to the status quo, right? It's like it's, it's disruptive only if you're in an, an essentially defensive posture, because almost always that new thing ends up being even bigger and more profitable than the old thing, right? So mm. uh, uh, last year... Uh, I, I'll get my figures almost right uh, within a few points. But last year, Tesla made $9,000 per vehicle uh, for per, per EV. Ford lost $34,000 per EV. So you can say, well, this wow. is disruptive. And of course, they could do it because, you know, they had nothing to lose. They are the most profitable car company in the world. There's a huge amount of money out there. It's, 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 it's disruptive only to your thinking. It's not disruptive to your shareholders. It's not disruptive to your bottom line. That's just like a, that's, this is a false way of thinking. And, and um, you know, and if anything, you, you could argue that the incumbents, you know, we have resources, we have technology, we have customers, we have factories. Tesla had to build that all from scratch. You know, it was just like backbreaking work. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, the other thing in, in that story for me, and it's, you know, not unique to Tesla, is that I, I just think a lot of leaders suffer from what I would call ADD. And I don't mean attention deficit disorder, although that's also a problem, but ambition deficit disorder. And mm. so, you know, I have this experience, Mike, when I talk to leaders and I ask them to do something like new and hard and difficult, the first question they always ask is, who else has done it? Like, you know, and as, and as long as I have lots of case studies and examples and a clear roadmap, okay, yeah, we, like we can do that. But the moment you ask them to like actually lead, like do something nobody's done before, my gosh, like it's like it's, you know, super, super kind of scary thing. And yet, you know, so, so, so what you find over time as companies grow and mature is the gap between aspirations and resources gets smaller and smaller. You know, you, you, you're, you're very rich. You can spend, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars a year in R&D and so on. But your aspiration is what? Like single digit growth and another 100 basis points in your margins or whatever. And so, you know, I've long believed, I wrote about this, you know, many, many years ago, but I, I really do believe that innovation almost always grows in the gap between aspirations and resources. And mm. so, you know, you, all these relatively small companies, newcomers that are resource poor, yeah, they may be resource poor, but they're aspiration rich. And so I like to make this distinction between, you know, more and more, Winning is not about your resources, it's your resourcefulness. And that comes when you, when you are in the thrall of an ambitious, noble kind of purpose that challenges you to think different and to take some, some kinds of risks and so on. Very, very few organizations I meet have anything like a compelling purpose, uh, you know, that, that uh, challenges them to think differently and to do new things. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, actually, in this idea of leadership being, you know, a definition of leadership or a definition of leading is to be doing something that hasn't been done before. Um, whereas our definitions of leadership that we typically use in business are much more in the, you know, in the command and control sort of structural, almost military version of leadership, aren't they? Yeah, I, you know, I think we, we terribly misuse this word leader. You know, it's, it's quite interesting, Mike. I was, I was thinking about this a few months back. And I went into Google Ngram where you can like track the number of mentions that a particular word or phrase gets, you know, in, in, in published works. 
And I looked at first uh, the phrase management development. And, you know, during the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, that thing is growing. You get to about the late 80s and 90s and management development as an idea like starts to fall off the cliff. And instead, you have this thing called leadership development that takes off, right? And, and here's my hypothesis. So by about 1970, 1980, everything you could say about what it takes to be a good manager had been said, most famously by Peter Drucker. And mm. so business schools, consulting companies, training companies, like they had, they needed something new to sell. Like, you know, being a manager, that was kind of a commodity. It wasn't very sexy. And so suddenly, like they gave everybody this battlefield upgrade and said, now you're a leader or a would-be leader, right? We can teach you how to be a leader. <laughs> Nothing changed right. in the curriculum. You know, nobody got any better at doing their job. We didn't, I mean, you know, you, you talk to people like Jeff Pfeffer at, at Harvard and or at Stanford or Barbara Kellerman at, at Harvard. They will tell you the whole, you know, 20, 30, $40 billion leadership industry is producing almost no value at all. And so, yeah, I think we started, and, you know, I go inside companies, they talk about the leadership team. I say, who the hell is that? What, what do you mean leadership team? Oh, oh, that's the top dozen executives. I said, here's two realities. First of all, most of them are not leaders. They're administrators, and they sure as hell aren't a team, right? Uh, they're at odds with each other, and they're fighting each other all the time. So, yeah, I think we, we got to reclaim the word leader for people who are, who are really leaders. And, you know, I think you can be a leader in a couple of ways. You can, you, you can be a leader that creates something out of nothing, um, you know, an entrepreneur like, like, like Elon Musk. Or you can be a leader that transforms something big and complicated, like, yeah, uh, you know, you, you, you see a few leaders uh, uh, that have done, like Satya Nadella at Microsoft, right, that have set the company on a new course, had the guts to kind of blow up the Windows division. But by golly, you know, real leaders are rare. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would put at the top, you know, when I look at, you know, and, and by the way, I think you only know that somebody's a leader in hindsight. You know, it's very, how do I, how do I know a leader until you've led, right? Because I can look at some, you know, I can do a personality thing or something. I, I, you know, but, but I would say what most distinguishes a leader is courage, right? And the willingness to try something new. And, um, you know, so, yeah, we, we need to be honest about who's a leader and who's not. And given the challenges we face as a species, we need a lot more leaders, right? We have a, a huge leadership shortage, but let's, you know, let's stop pretending that administrators are leaders. These are completely different, you know, you, you, you might be a good administrator and a good leader, but, you know, the fact that you have subordinates doesn't make you a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, in, in enterprises then, how do we actually create more of, you know, those leaders that you describe, right? People who are actually going to, you know, break things, change things, create new things. I, I think you have to give, you know, I, I, I don't think, I don't think we need to spend more on leadership development because basically, uh, you know, when, you know, nine, ninety percent of the but of the leadership development budget gets spent on the top two or three levels of the organization. That's that the, you know, hmm. I think you create more leaders by giving people more opportunities to lead, and that means breaking big organizations down into smaller pieces. You know, I, I go back, you know, when. When Hewlett Packard was a truly innovative, at, at the time, maybe the most innovative company in the world, every time a business got to $50 million, they broke it up. And so they kept creating this opportunity for people to build things and, and so on. Uh, hire the same thing. You know, there we, we a 50,000 person organization in China, we divided that into 4,000 micro enterprises. So you have all these mm -hmm. relatively small businesses that, that have huge upside and growth potential. And that's, you know, and, and then you make it easy for people to start new businesses. That's how you find who your leaders are. But you have to give more chances to lead. You know, the, the kind of sad thing is in, in, most, in most organizations, the way to the top job is ultimately to manage the biggest legacy business and don't screw it up, right? That's how you finally get to be CEO. And yet, you know, that business should be running mostly on autopilot. The, the people that we need to be promote to CEO are people who, who built things, who built new businesses, are real leaders, not people who you know, uh, eked out, you know, a little bit more out of, out of a 50 or 100 year old legacy business. So, um, yeah, you want more leaders, you have to give more opportunities for people to lead. It's not yeah. very complicated. <laughs> yeah. Early in my career, I worked for Mitsushita, who's a, you know, the big Japanese sure. conglomerate, you know, brands like Panasonic and Technics. You, you, if you want to think of, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> if you want to think of, of brands that have kind of faded, <laughs> they, they're, they're the house of faded brands. <laughs> And um, it was a fascinating place to work for. I think I worked there for four years because typical Japanese company, bad news, never traveled up. You know, like there was just no invention at the 
at the periphery. It was very much like it was like you worked in a big military organization. And I moved from there to to Acer, which was at the time a um, a Taiwanese kind of challenger mm-hmm. brand in the computer industry. And the thing that fascinated me there is the definition of management was so different. Whereas you know in, in Panasonic, your manager told you what to do. Um, at at Acer, I would describe a manager sort of as a, sort of as a referee that just mm-hmm. kind of got involved when things got out of hand. <laughs> you know, like when the when all the little different components which were which were charged with building their own businesses effectively, when they started fighting, <laughs> you know, fighting on the ice, so to speak, then the then the referee would zip in there. <laughs> yeah, the manager would kind of zip in there. Other than that, though, you were you were on your own. And certainly at that era, you know, that early stage of consumer computing, Acer was just flying because of that. Um, you know, that ability to make decisions on the floor effectively or on the ice, I, I as I that's, might describe that's, it. That's, that's, that's absolutely critical. And um, you know, I I, th- I think there's there's a we overweight in most organizations. We overweight alignment. Right, we overweight consensus. Uh, we overweight homogenization. We overweight standardization. All of those things are good and have their place. But you know, in a world where you have incredible amount of change, where opportunities kind of come and go at light speed, uh, you 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 know, you also need a lot of divergence. You need a lot of people trying new things and 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 challenging the existing model and so on. You know, I, well, one of the triggers for me, and this, this is literally like almost a trigger. Word, when I when I hear some CEO talk about their company saying we want to be one fill in the blank like one name a big company I go no you don't like that's the worst possible thing you don't want to have everybody thinking alike everybody aligned up you know everybody like focused on no you don't and you know I, I guess it was I'm trying to think of the the, the guy's name famous cybertician uh, 50 years ago in the UK his name will come back to me but you know the law of requisite variety which is a very powerful concept which basically says if the variety inside the system, the amount of experimentation inside the system does not match the level of variety and experimentation outside the system, you lose, right? So, yeah, we, yeah. and again, this is kind of our bureaucratic inheritance of just, you know, putting a huge emphasis on alignment, control, focus, uh, conformance, compliance. All of those are good things. But I think most organizations are way over indexed on them. And that's probably what happened to, you know, Matsushita versus Acer. Mm, the law of requisite variety. I've not heard that before. Um, so I just want to kind of s- switch angles a little bit for a second. Um, yeah, if you look at if you look at Joyous, what we do at Joyous is that we you know, we unlock the the expertise often in the front line. So those folk that, as you describe, are maybe six layers down and know how stuff actually gets done. Yeah, you, know, you can kind of use their expertise to move the business forward. And we see great examples in our customer base of that that expertise being utilised. But I tell you what, most of the time I see it being utilized for kind of incrementalism. You know, I, I see it being utilized to improve the adoption of a new tool or process or, or, or make a process you know, more cost efficient or mm-hmm. something. Is, is, there a, is there a beat we're missing here once you get the ability to actually engage the front line in, in making things better that we should just be more ambitious with that? You know, I, I think so, Mike. I mean, first of all, you know, I think what Joyce is doing is 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 fantastic, um, and and long overdue. Uh, so let me give a lot of credit there first. You know, when when you look at the data, and we've looked at this like from every possible angle of, across different countries and so on, the the reality is, without a doubt, most organizations waste more human capacity than they use. That's just like a fact. You know, I, I saw a big study done across thirty thousand European enterprises just before COVID where only 25% of European managers said that they thought frontline employees were important to to competitive advantage. Like, what are you thinking? These are the people who interact with their customer every day and so on. And and so, and you look at the Gallup data on employee engagement, which is dismal, dismal, dismal. So the fact that you are going in and, and turning on the problem solving skills of those employees is absolutely fundamental. You know, companies that have done this for a long time are like Toyota. A very famous Toyota uh, production suggestion scheme, TPSS. Um, you know, they generate between one and two million suggestions every year out of their employees. And most of them, by the way, are not suggestions because what they've done, and I think this is kind of, you know, the next step for Joyous in a way, is it's not about like, in you know, just opening up, uh, uh, you know, for ideas. It's about training people how to take ideas, 
how to do peer review locally, and then how to run an experiment and collect data. So most of the Mm -hmm. the so-called suggestions in the Toyota system are not suggestions. These are things some team has already tried, and now they're sharing what they've done, right? And here's here's what we're learning out of that. Um, so, you know, rather than waiting for you know some manager to say this is okay, and and you know you can you can you can you know we'll we'll take this idea seriously. But you guys are 100 on the right track. I do think though, as you're suggesting, there's bigger challenges to work on. You know, I've led through the years a bunch of open strategy projects where we have you know we have hundreds or thousands of of, of employees and. And I, I think the critical thing, when, when, when you want to try to harness the collective imagination of your organization, one of the critical things that's often missed is you may need to make them smarter before you ask for an opinion. Because often, if you just go out and say, like, what's the problem? You'll just get what's top of mind. So when we do this work, you know, we will, we will train, and we've trained hundreds of thousands of people. We'll train them. How do you get at the unarticulated needs of your customers? How do you understand the deep frustrations, the things they can't even articulate, but you can see it in their eyes, you can hear it in their voice, or you just see something they're wrestling with, like, why are we putting that difficulty in front of them? We, we, we teach people how to be alert to emerging trends, right? What do, you, what do you see in lifestyles, technology, regulation that your competitors are not yet paying attention to that you might be able to leverage? We, we teach them how to kind of deconstruct their own organization away from products and services into these deeper capabilities. And which of these might be platforms for doing something new? So we we start typically by training thousands of people to think like business innovators, and then we ask them to, you know, build a, a foundation of insights. So what are those insights you have about the needs of customers and so on? We don't ask them for an idea yet. Just what are you seeing? What's the insight? What is changing? And then once you build like this rich population of insights, then you can start to ask people. All right, given all those insights, we you know, and 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 I and I have to say, you know. The most important thing, Mike, I believe about any strategy is how it's different from every other strategy. And you cannot build a differentiated strategy on undifferentiated insights. So if you're looking at the same data, segmenting the market the same, if you believe the same thing all your competitors are, there's no chance you're going to. So you have to start by building a foundation of of, of kind of unique uh, insights. And then you can say, people, well, we have this this point of view about a customer. We have this point of view about technology. This uh, Like if you put these things together, what do you see? So we've developed some pretty slick algorithmic ways of, you know, very rapidly kind of cross hatching uh, different sorts of trends and, and asking people where are the opportunities there. But I think, you know, you, you simply cannot, you know, the more people, the more voices, the better, you know, is, is the simple answer there. So I'm hoping, you know, I, I think it has a long ways to go. I, I recently wrote, wrote a forward for a book on, on uh, open strategy. But, you know, leaders are pretty jealous of their prerogatives. And, you know, you might ask, like, well, why are we paying a CEO 300 times as much if, like, they're not the ones that, like, have the tablets of stone and, you know, the crystal ball and are setting strategy? And I would argue that is not the role of a leader anymore. The role of a leader is to be an architect. You have to architect the process. You have to architect the platform that allows people to come and contribute. And that's what Joyce is doing, right? You guys have built a platform. You've architected a way of running campaigns and getting a lot of, of, of smart people to think about an issue and getting to a solution. That's really the role of leadership is, is figuring out what's the system, what's the incentives, what's the architecture for unleashing and harnessing the imagination of the organization, not, you know, I have to be seen as the smartest person in the room and the strategist in chief because that's what I'm paid for. No, that's, that's you know, you're, you're not that and you need to admit that, but there's still important work to do in terms of building an organization where you have open strategy, where you have where a lot of the resource allocation decisions are made through crowdfunding and, and, the, and the wisdom you know, of the crowd and so on. And, but um, yeah, there's where you guys are starting with on kind of operational problems. That's a good place to start because that's real to companies. They know that their frontline employees are out there and seeing this every day. But, uh, you know, the ambition should be, I think, beyond that, because um, in terms of creating strategy, uh, for sure, we need a lot more voices in the room than what we have typically. Are you optimistic for the future of the enterprise? Hmm, I am. I guess you have to you have to have a, a argue over what time frame. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, here's here's why. Here's I'll give you a reason why I'm optimistic and why I'm less optimistic. But on balance, I'm optimistic. The reason I'm optimistic, Mike, is when I talk to CEOs and leaders, pretty much all of them will now admit that the real problem of their organization is not the operating model. It's not logistics, supply chain, back office, whatever. Uh, it's not even the business model, although they know that needs to change over time. 
More and more leaders will now say, yeah, our real problem is our organizational or management model. We have too many layers. We're too slow. We're not entrepreneurial enough. We spend too much time fighting, you know, internal battles and so on. They don't really know how to change it because, you know, virtually every large scale organization on the planet still fits, you know, this 150 year old bureaucratic template. So most leaders have never been inside of an organization that doesn't at its core look like the one they're in right now. As I said, you know, Power trickles down, big leaders appoint little leaders, uh, managers assign tasks and assess performance, uh, employees compete for the scarce resource of promotion. So you just assume that's the only way you can manage large, you know, large numbers of people at work. It's not. And in our book, Humanocracy, you know, we have all these crazy examples like Birdsorg in the Netherlands, which runs a 16,000 person healthcare organization with two managers. That's a one to 8,000 span of control in a highly regulated industry, right? So there are, mm-hmm. there are all these alternatives but most leaders have not seen them, right? And mm-hmm. so, you know, it's a little bit like when, when the Iberian explorers uh, first went to the so-called New World, uh, the indigenous people had not yet invented the wheel. And so you kind of think like, what would have been your reaction the first time you saw a wheel and a wagon? You go, oh crap, we've been dragging this crap all this time? Like, really? Like there was a better way? <laughs> so I think, you know, a lot of it's just time. You know, leaders need to be start to believe there are other ways of kind of large scale organization than, you know, eight layers and, and bureaucracy. So I'm, you know, and they I'm just, optimistic. They just haven't, they haven't seen it. Out. They just haven't yeah. seen it. Having said that, you know, if you look at deeply embedded social systems through history, whether that was patriarchy or slavery or aristocracy, bureaucracy is, is deeply embedded social structures. And, you know, it's one that kind of, uh, empowers the few at the expense of, of the many. Um, what gets you ahead is not really your value added, but how le- well you learn to play the bureaucratic game of negotiating targets, managing up, deflecting blame, hoarding resources, right? All these things that you learn how to, you know, you play this, this game. And I think it's, you know, and, and if you've learned to play that game very well and you've developed that over a career, it's a little bit hard, you know, to see that change at, at, at higher, um, they took 11,000 middle managers and reassigned them into these micro enterprises. And they mm. went from seven or eight levels to two. Those jobs will never come back, right? We, you know, to, it, you know if, you, if you go back and sometimes it's, it's important to remember that every technology is, is, is a product of its time. So if you go back into the mid 19th century or late 19th century when big industrial enterprises like Ford were, were first you know, being built, at that time, most employees were illiterate. Information was very expensive to gather and move. And the cheapest way of doing it was having 10 people who'd report to a manager who would aggregate their data, report up the chain of command. And only the people at the top had the whole picture. Um, it was a time when administrative skills were very rare. You know, we, we were just inventing this person called a, a manager. That's why business schools got created back in that time to start, you know, uh, training these people. Now, administrative skills are a commodity. Like nobody wins because you have better managers than the next company, uh, next organization. Uh, change was relatively gradual. All of those things have changed, right? And yet, you know, now you have smart employees. They all can have this, the information real time. They, they, you know, they're smart enough to make the right judgments and so on. And yet, you know, we're still, you know, running these eight, nine layer organizations with disempowered people on the front line. I mean, so... But but that's that social structure is very, very deeply embedded. And by the way, you see this in government as well. I, we've just been looking at this in the United States with with NASA and the FDA and the Center for Disease Control and the Veterans Administration and so on. My Lord, Mike, you know, eight, nine, ten layers, hundreds of a, like people have to sign off to get anything done. And so you just have this accretion of bureaucracy over time. And we have the data on this. We know that. For example, the United States, the number of bureaucratic jobs has been growing four times faster than all other kinds of employment. And it's not driven by external external Mm -hmm. uh, regulation. It's driven by the fact, you know, and one of the things nobody really wants to talk about, when you when you get to sit inside the middle of some large bureaucratic organization with some kind of BS synthetic goals, KPIs and so on, with some kind of peer review process where everybody gets rated at 4.5. You have just insulated yourselves from real accountability, right? And I suppose all of us, in a way, we you know we'd like to be somewhere where it's hard to judge what we're doing. 
Um, you know, there's no real downside for us. So, you know, being in the middle of a bureaucratic organization is a pretty cushy, safe kind of way to live. And you have largely insulated yourself from the marketplace. But by golly, we can't afford that anymore. Uh, are you saying that maybe human beings like to be in a bureaucratic organization? Yeah, there's some comfort in that. You know, like I, we can I all complain so. about it. But yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe that's one of the drivers. There's a lot it's actually of comfort a comfortable in. place. You know, I see this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think there is a lot of a lot of comfort in it, and you know, I think in many ways what you see in these large organizations is kind of a conspiracy of mediocrity, where mm. you know I, I see this among top teams, right? You know, I won't really challenge you, Mike, if you don't challenge me, right? I'll kind of you know vote for your pet project if you'll vote for mine, but nobody. And so you know, if if you look at some of these, you know, what I would call post bureaucratic organizations where you, you have small teams and the performance of every team is visible real time to everybody else. There's no place for mediocrity to hide. You know, yeah. that's in a way it's very empowering, but in a way it's also a little bit frightening because like, yeah, I definitely am really frightening. Accountable now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, um, I'll, I'll vote for your pet project, Gary, if that's okay. Um, Sorry? <laughs> hey, so... I'll, I'll vote for your pet project. All right, all right good. So, I, I, so, I'll return the so, favor. <laughs> excellent. We've got this strategy working. Um, uh, we, we've got the basis of a bureaucracy right there. Hey, when I started this conversation, I, I said that you were an iconoclastic business thinker, and um, you, you know it doesn't take much of an of an internet search to see many people view you that way. And when you when you look at yeah, you know, what iconoclastic means. It means being willing to kind of attack cherished beliefs or institutions. Just my final question for you, Gary, is does does being iconoclastic get tiring? Um you know, only, only to the extent that, you know, you, you have to make the same argument over and over again, or, or you, you have to point out the, the 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 same inanities that we take for granted over and over again, or you have to challenge the same kind of deeply embedded beliefs that nobody has thought to like think about in a long time. So yeah, in a sense, but I'll tell you what, I I you know I'd rather be on that kind of a path and and than than kind of be following the herd. I do think it, it it sometimes limits one's impact and effectiveness because you know a lot of people are quite comfortable with with the status quo, and you know I I I won't name names because I don't want to embarrass anybody particularly, but one of the uh, managing partners of one of the biggest consulting companies in, 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 in the Harvard Business Review wrote the following a couple of years back. This is like almost 100% direct quote, would be very close. He said, the CEO, CFO, and CHRO will look over the horizon and plot the future while everyone else has their heads buried in operations. No, I think that's just, that's rubbish. Like, I mean, I, I, I can almost not imagine anything more stupid to say. But yeah, there's these few people at the top who are like so prescient and so smart, they're going to find the future. Everybody else just like turn the crank. Like, no, in fact, that's where we started the conversation. That is exactly the wrong way to bet. You know, I remember Steve Ballmer in 2007, then the head of Microsoft saying the iPhone would get no, no market share ever, right? You know? Um, and, and all those people in the car industry dismissing Tesla and so on. So, so he's like, why would anybody like say that? Well, because it's the people at the top that write your checks. And so you continue to yeah. tell them how smart they are and how, you know, and, and, and most of them are smart. It's the problem is in this world, you are not smart enough by yourself. So, yeah, I think being willing to challenge conventional wisdom. But, but I would say, Mike, that is the second important characteristic of a leader. A leader has to have courage, but you also have to be a contrarian because if you see a problem that has been there for a long time, like polluting vehicles or expensive health care or whatever it may be, you know you cannot solve that problem with conventional thinking. You know, the, the, the story I loved best from Steve Jobs, from his, his autobiography and his life was him, him talking about, I guess he had dropped out of, was it Stanford somewhere? He dropped out of school and he took a course in calligraphy. And he said, this had nothing to do with any career I would ever pursue. But I started to understand the beauty of typography and serif and sans serif and the spacing between letters. And, and he said it was like it was it was historical and magical. And he said, only one years later, I came to working on the Mac. Did all this come back to me? 
right? And so, you know, if if as a leader, if if you are not learning places other people are not learning, if you're not reading things other people mm-hmm. are not reading, at least then you're Melu, uh, you know, if you're not saying, well, what is nobody talking about or what does everybody take for granted? Uh, if, if you are unable to step outside the, the boundary of conventional thinking, there's very little difference you really can make in the world. You're going to be very incremental. So I think, you know, I, I have to give some credit to that for my colleague, Siki Prahlad, now gone, who was very much an iconoclast. But, you know, my, my practical advice to anybody listening today is in any meeting you're sitting in, in any conversation, any task you're given, ask the question, what are the beliefs everybody takes for granted? And are these actually like physics or just the dead hand of tradition? Um, is there an analogy or something I can learn outside of this situation in another area of expertise, in another industry, another field that might illuminate this, right? That would bring some new perspective here. Uh, and, and, and what aren't people talking about? What is missing in this conversation? So it's, it's not that hard to start to train yourself to kind of come at everything laterally. And sometimes you'll be wrong and you'll say, no, this is, this is the only way to do things. But, you know, I, I think it was the great uh, British um, essayist, uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton, who said, uh, a dead thing goes with the stream, but only a living thing can swim against it. And, <laughs> you know, I want to be that living stream and that swims against the current. And by God, does it take more energy to swim against it than to go with it? But at least you're in control of your own destiny. And it's not, uh, you know, just outside forces that are propelling you along. Gary, I think that's the perfect place to wrap this up. Thank you so much for your time. It's really, really been, it's been an exciting Gosh, 45 minutes. What a ride. Thank you again. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. This has been the Joyous Podcast, brought to you by Joyous, human conversations and AI analytics in one. Find out more at joyoushq.com. If you liked this show, make sure to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of the Joyous Podcast was hosted by Mike Carden and produced by Kai Crow, Karen Rayner, and Brandon Berman. Thanks for joining us. And remember, everyone deserves to be joyous.